Hello and welcome back to the Sunday session. My name's Steve Judge. I'm your host of this Football Network World uh, presentation, which brings together football practitioners from around the world. Um, today, I'm joined by two guys who are very high up the tree in the world of uh, analysis. Um, yeah, and we'll have them discussing about how can we better use data to evaluate player attributes and traits. Uh, but before I introduce you to Geffen and Enrico, let me uh, share with you a little bit more about what you can expect in the next hour or so. So on today's Sunday session, as always, once we've got through uh, the introductions, uh, Gethin and Enrico will provide you with a couple of short presentations around their work in, uh, in, in an analysis. And then we'll kind of delve a little bit deeper into that with a discussion with the two guys, sort of a sort of important starting point of knowing your club. What are, what are the traits that are important to the, your club? What are the ones of value that you can then focus how you start to look at different players that you may be looking to bring in to your club? Secondly, on top of that, then we'll look at the current approaches, what they do and how they do it for having a kind of more open discussion about how they see that world of recruitment analysis evolving, where it's at now, where they expect it going in the future and, and where, where are those gaps? Where do things kind of maybe need to change a little bit to, to really improve things? But before we can get to that, let me uh, introduce you to today's guest. So uh, I think we'll start with uh, introducing you to Enrico Rajo. He's the head of data performance at Spezia and Casapia. Enrico, how are you today? Hi, Steve. Thank you for the introduction. I'm good. I'm good. Weather is not as great here, but uh, I'm good myself. And uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's one of those. Seems like it's one of those days. I think it's it's not a, a great day uh, anywhere we are in the world. But uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we can brighten things up over the next hour. Um, so yeah, I'll sort of uh, hand it over to you then for uh, the next minute or so, just to share a little bit about your background with everyone. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so my name is Enrico. I'm 33 years old. At the moment, I'm working as a head of data performance for the Playtech Football Group. From, from since the start of 2021, before I was uh, working as a data scientist at a health insurance company. I've done this for six years. And in my free time during the evenings and in the weekend, I started doing some uh, football related analysis work. And uh, after doing this as a hobby, as a, to start, well, it was as a hobby to start with, but always with the idea it would be so cool if I would be able to do this for a living. And yeah, after doing this, uh, uh, football analysis uh, stuff as a hobby for two years. I ended up uh, working in football um, as a data scientist, and uh, yeah, been doing this for almost two years now. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Enrico. And uh, our second guest on today's Sunday session is uh, Gethin Rees. He's currently lecturer of performance analysis at UCFB in London and Manchester. Gethin, how how are you today? Good, Steve. Thanks for having me. Um, I don't think I need to go on about the weather, but yeah, it's not great here in South Wales either. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, yeah, let's skip over that as quickly as yeah. possible then, and uh, and sort of yeah, see if you can uh, share like Enrico. They just share a little bit with us about your your current roles and your your background in uh, performance analysis. Yeah, um, a little bit different to Enrico. Basically, like a lot of people probably listening. All I wanted to ever do in my life was play football. Got injured when I was 18 at an academy. Um, so continued on the academic group. Actually got my um, got my degree in sports science and then fell into sort of performance analysis. Was very, very lucky to get um, a research opportunity originally with Roberto Martinez when he was at Swansea City back in the days when we were third division. And basically, once you get your foot in the door, done a good job, found a love for it and just snowballed from there. So... Time at Swansea City went from doing research to being an analyst as part of a team to, luckily enough, heading up the department with Michael Loudrup, Gary Monk. 
and then really went from performance analysis, basically looking at opposition, reflective practice, um, having conversations with um, Gary Monk at the time about recruitment and about how performance analysis, data, statistics, video feedback can help in the recruitment process. So I went into that um, with Swansea City under Gary, switched hats a little bit when I ran a master's at Middlesex University in performance analysis. But then the lure of football was a little bit too strong. Um, and I had a phone call from Gary when he went to Birmingham and went to Birmingham for three years um, as the recruitment analyst there. Um, currently back in, as you mentioned, currently back in academia, but still performance analysis, effectively training up um, future analysts from London and Manchester, hopefully to get them a career in this wonderful game that we all love. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Geffen. Um, I think yeah, I'll leave things with you then, Geffen. Um, this, the floor is yours, as they say, if you want to take over the screen and uh, share your, your presentation with us. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Um, hopefully this works straight away. And hopefully everyone can see that. So basically, yep. I've just done a couple of couple of slides, couple of minutes presentation, trying to keep it as generic as possible so we can get a little bit of conversation after. But looking at player recruitment in a professional game, what do we do? Um, what you know, what's the background? So basically, what I thought about is starting at the very beginning when we're looking at recruitment. Are we talking about recruitment or are we talking about scouting? Do we use those sort of two terms interlinked or are they separate things? So I've just put a little slide up here about like when we're talking about scouting, the practice of going out watching games, you sort of get that uh, that image of a guy sitting in the stands or on the side of a pitch of his notebook, what they're actually looking for. And the FA done a pretty good job, actually. You know, they, they, they break down the four corner model where they're looking at the technical and tactical social, physical, psychological, and then they break it down a little bit further. Then if you go into the research of what you're looking at in possession, out of possession, for example. So they're all great um, sort of basic points to look for. But as we know, when you when the scouting process, within the scouting process, there's a lot of emotion, there's a lot of personal feeling, there's a lot of subjectivity. So this is where really um, my start of going into recruitment began, where can we match the data, the hard facts, the objective information with the scouting reports? Um, furthermore, if a scout is coming with a player X, can we marry that up with data to bring out a whole raft of players that we haven't heard of who have got very similar attributes? So basically, that's sort of my jumping off point. What is recruitment? Obviously, recruitment is looking to get players into your club, but is there any different, the process to scouting, what we traditionally see? So my background, as I said, is performance analysis, primarily looking at, you know, what my team does, who's the strong players, who are the weak players, and then when we're playing on a Saturday, what are the, you know, the pros and cons of the opposition. And that story's gone basically from hand notation, just standing there taking notes or drawing diagrams to more powerful computer technology comes on the screen. And lo and behold, we can have these massive databases um, we can hold, uh, we can do complex equations at a touch of a button and get some nice slick reports out. Um, and recruitment really, I see, is no different now. So we've gone from just having the scout write in his notes to having these databases on players from, uh, you know, Holland, um, Germany, France, and comparing them with some sort of complex metric from what we've got in our club or what's available in England, Wales, Scotland. So we gives us the opportunity to look further afield because technology reigns at, at the moment. The important thing for me is the context. So when I was um, performing any recruitment, I'd always have to have context. A lot of the old, um, sorry, the old is probably the wrong word, but a lot of the traditional scouts, obviously, uh, um, as mentioned, use subjectivity. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because we've got the expert eye. Who am I to say that, you know, someone who's played 400 games in the Premier League can't tell me what's a good player. So I think I'm very wary of discounting what the traditional scout is telling me what a player is, but can we match it up? Can we help them in some sort of way using objective information, whether that be statistical or um, video? Um, 
So that sort of leads then to the data driven approach versus the expert eye. I think there's a place for both. It just depends obviously on the, the, the level of the club or the, the financial uh, power of the club of how much investment they put in either or. And that goes down to philosophy as well. The next thing I would sort of touch upon is how much data is needed. And this is one thing that I always, always mention. Data is great, but it can also be misleading. Um, with my students at the moment, I always chuck out an example such as James Milner or Ryan Giggs, who, was, who spanned multiple seasons. What are they? Well, if you take their career as a whole, they fall somewhere in the middle. But someone like Ryan Giggs starts off as a flying winger. As he gets older, maturation, he lands up as a centre midfielder. So what is relevant data? How long do you go back? Um, so we always have to put this context um, in place, looking at players um, in sort of in a different light of just saying, right, over the last five games, he has done this. That's fine. But is that a true representation of what they are? Um, which leads on to sort of uh, the, 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 the maturity of a player. Obviously, if you're looking at a 17, 18, 19 year olds breaking into a first team, they, they're going to have these ups and downs. They're going to have these peaks and troughs of performance because at that age, they're not the finished article. Yes, we have ex exceptions to the rule. We were lucky enough to have Jude Bellingham when I was at Birmingham. And at a very, very young age, you could see that he was, you know, he was going to make it. And um, obviously, he's hopefully he's going to star for England in the World Cup. But that type of player at such a young age are few and far between. So how much emphasis do we put on this variation at a young age? Or are we just looking at something different? Is the is the the the, the expert eye more relevant in these cases? That's sort of a question as opposed to an answer. The other thing I, I, I found a lot and I have experienced is that you can, through the data, get the right player, but for the wrong club. So that goes down to the philosophy of the club fantastic stats let's get them in but if you if you're not going to play to his strengths or possibly you're you're actually enhancing his weaknesses then this data driven um uh, sort of philosophy falls down so the prime example you've got a center forward um who loves the aerial duel in the box but you don't play crosses into the box there's been many of them in the last couple of years which uh some some high profile ones which with that debate has, has run on about so when I'm looking at the other thing I, I do when I'm looking at a player is I try to see the bigger picture. So once I've got the data, I do go down um, the route where we look for, um, get the video and make our own um, statistics looking at code in the game. So sort of a bespoke approach where we take what the manager um, or the coaching staff at the time specifically want from a left back, right back, midfielder, whatever it may be, and try to clip up those instances in the game and feed them back. But with the premises that we know, we've all got examples as football fans where teams will play different from home and away. You get that guy who stands out, he's a leader and he's consistent home and away. You get the other guy who pretty much loves playing at home. There's a whole raft of research on home advantage. So we're all familiar with why they do it. So you look, you, you look at those traits, scoreline effects. You know, have you got a centre forward who bangs in the goals when you're 3-0 up? So his stats are quite inflated. Do you take him who scored 20 goals? Or are you better looking at the centre forward who scored 13, but all his goals are meaningful? They're always the goal in a 1-0 a win or a 2-1 win, uh, two, two win when it really means something. Um, the last thing I sort of talk about on this then is sort of the defensive metrics. We are so driven to when we look for um, data on the ball stuff is that obviously the defenders don't come out that great. I watch Sky Sports News all the time and you see those little graphics come up and it gives you a stat about, you know, the top keeper in the league because of his save percentage or the top defender because of his tackles. And they all tend to be for the teams that are lower down the league. Well, that sort of makes sense in itself. And I go back to the, I love this quote by Maldini, probably one of the best uh, defenders in the last, say, 30, 40 years, that if he's, if he's had to make a tackle, he's already made a mistake. So using sort of um, tackle percentages, win or, win or lose, possibly isn't the best way of looking, look, looking at defensive metrics. So can we look for something else um, 
off the ball, which are very, very hard when you're using sort of third party information to make these judgment calls. So that's just a little bit of um, how I would use context in the data. And then dependent on the team, I'm just going to give you a little example. I'm not going to go through the process by which um, this is collected. But effectively, you have to have an insight to what the manager is looking for. So this isn't um, an example of I would go out and look at every player here. Basically, this would be a starting point from a league that we don't know about or a country that we have limited scouts in and using a data-driven approach um, for a central midfielder. What exactly are you looking for? Are you looking for someone who's an attacking threat and keeps the ball? Obviously, everyone wants that, but they tend to be the players that are very expensive. Or are you happy with someone who's got low attacking threat, but a high passing ability, so they keep the ball moving? And again, this type of scenario doesn't mean if you're you know, top left, bottom right, that you're a good or bad player. It's about fitting the player specifically on the data to what your club's philosophy is and what you're looking for, given that position um, in, that, in, in that specific time. And, and that's it for me at the moment. Perfect. Thanks, Getting. I think that's kind of a nice little overview that gives us a, a good foundation from which to, to go to go forward. Um, and next we'll move forward with uh, Enrico. I think we'll go into then a little bit more specifically about how how he goes about things out with Spezia and Cassiopeia. Yep. I'll share my screen. Can you see it? Yep, that's perfect. Thanks, Enrico. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So, like I said, uh, I already did a bit of introduction, so I'll keep this one very short. I'm working as the head of data performance for the Plato Cooper Group, which consists at the moment of two clubs, which is Casapia in Portugal and Spezia in Italy. For those interested, Casapia plays today at 6 UK time and they're doing really well in the Portuguese. They have, they have been promoted this season and they are in fourth or fifth, so we're doing really well there. So always interesting to watch, in my opinion. Um, yeah, so we are a data, and a data analytics team within the Playtech Football Group consisting of three people at the moment. And what we do is we are involved into data-driven player recruitment, Position analysis and performance analysis of the own teams. And for this presentation, I'll focus on the recruitment side because this is it's mo was mostly this is the major of main of um, subject of this uh, of this Sunday session. So we have an old approach and a new approach which we introduced recently within our recruitment. And I have to give great credits to my colleague Piotr here because he is the guy, the main guy developing all of, all of this. So. Uh, Credits to him. I'll start off with uh, what I would call a more traditional kind of data profile that we used until not too long ago. I think we all know the data profiles that appear everywhere on the internet, the stats bomb radars or uh, many kinds of bar charts with a lot of uh, statistics on a certain player targeted to a certain position. But we identified a few things that could be improved in our old approach and it is that it could be targeted better by which i mean for example we have chris wood here and we are also evaluating chris wood on expected assist and shots assisted but it's not necessarily what he's asked to do or his style of play so it, it's not fair to um to uh, evaluate him on this stats because you know he would come out badly on on them because he is not asked to do so so they could be targeted better to based on what the player is doing what the coach is asking him to do, what the, what the philosophy of the club is in the end. And we also had me metrics that uh, in the end, they refer to the same underlying ability. For example, again, expected assist and shot assisted, yeah, they are always correlated, tied together. So why would you show both of them if they are telling you the same thing? So it would be better of showing only picking one stats that, uh, uh, describes chance creation and use that one only stat in the data profile. There are also metrics that don't necessarily measure quality, but they, they measure more the style of play. For example, the amount of box touches or the amount of dribbles and carries. 
if you have a fox in the box type of striker, yes, then you are interested in the amount of box touches. But if you have a guy who you want to, a, a false nine or a link up striker, we want to drop deep combined with the midfielders, it's not necessarily useful to look at box touches because it's not the main thing that you want him to do. And there were some aspects of play missing, not necessarily in this, uh, in this uh, striker profile, but for example, something that Getting also mentioned a few minutes ago about the defensive stats. When you look at defenders' traditional uh, data profiles, they they uh, focus on tackles made, tackles presented, interceptions, pressures, uh, stuff like that. But what if you have a a um, a, a centre back duo? One of them is more the uh, the uh, the. I don't know if you guys know the the cat and dog analogy, where you have the 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 dog is the more active proactive defender, he steps out, engages opponents, tries to win the ball back. And then you have the cat playing next to him with more the guy that, that covers spaces in behind. But that, that covering defender, he's not tasked with may, maybe making a lot of uh, tackles or interceptions, but he is more the guy that should be uh, covering spaces and making sure that, uh, that uh, the opponent does not uh, go and play into his area of, uh, of action. So we try to Add, to add some metrics that tell us more about the context and what a player is doing is asked to do. So things that traditional stats slash metrics were not uh, are not yet uh, uh, measuring counting. So then we went on into the improved approach, which starts with a, the basic idea that there is a player on the pitch and there is the things that he does because he is asked to do them. Uh, so his style of play, and there is the his skills, his performance. So how good is he doing certain things? For example, uh, we have here um, the, his style of play could be we call it his role. So for a winger, we we might want to have a winger who is uh, a traditional wide winger who runs down the the the, the touch line, dribbles past opponent, uh, puts in crosses. For such a player, you want to have and high dribble and ball carrying volume in his, the way that he, a high uh, action volume for dribbles and, uh, and ball carries, whether an inside winger who is asked to cut inside, you don't want him to run a lot, but maybe position himself smartly, play, play a lot of uh, one touch passes, passes into the box. So these the style measures, they're not about good and bad, but it's, it's about uh, how often is uh, someone doing something and what is he not doing based on how he likes to play and how the coach wants him to play. And then we have the skills, the performance side of the data, and which means, okay, if a player is asked to dribble often, how good is he doing it? Is, is he uh, managing to beat his opponent one-on-one -on -one often in, on a percentage basis? Is he able to create danger after the dribble? So, and these performance metrics, you can also measure them for the inside winger which you don't necessarily want to dribble often but if he ends up in a situation that he has, that he has to dribble then can he still do it yes or no so we made a clear split between style of play and outcome of actions and we used this these um, these two things to create roles for example here i've we have created the, the role box striker. What do we want a box striker to do in terms of style? We want a low pass volume because we don't want him to drop back and uh, uh, to drop deep and combine with his teammates. Now he has to be in the area always ready to get on the end of chances and uh, to score goals. So we want him to, have him to have high shot volume, high box touch rate, which translates into the, the, the style of play that we want for this player. And on the left side, quality, what do we want him to be good at? We want him to have high expected goals, high head expected goals, because usually in the box you play the ball with, uh, well, with, with crosses, high crosses, low crosses are getting more and more common. So, uh, but in general, box striker has to, be, has to get on the end of uh, crosses. He has to have the ability to to win aerial duels and also make runs in behind the last line of defense again to get on the end of this, uh, of the key passes assists. So with the, the left side of the of the let's say the the role we can evaluate the ability of the player. Does the player 
possess the skills demanded to fulfill this particular role. And with the, the right side of the of the of the role, we can see okay, this is does this player fit into what we what we what the coach wants him to do, what we what the club philosophy is of a uh, of a striker. And so we went on to define several roles for every position on the pitch. I think we have yeah, this, we have four striker roles here. I think for Mr. we have maybe five or something because they are more versatile. And um, we split these roles into attacking and defending. Again, is something that uh, is similar to what uh, Gavin said. Uh, the defensive side is. Uh, not really well not yeah maybe it is often also overlooked but in general what i see in the public sphere of analytics that then they people define roles but they have one role which uh, consists of all kinds of magic both attacking and defending but in this case i want to show an example why we made the split if you have a box striker sometimes you want the box striker playing in a team that also plays in a high press system then you want to, him to be good at pressing but if you are a team that uh, plays with a low block and uh, you are one of the bottom teams of the league, you still want this kind of box striker, but you want him to be good also at dropping back and being part uh, of the uh, taking, uh, being involved in the defensive side of the game. So uh, the way to the, the reason to split these roles is because one attacking role can have uh, several uh, um, defensive roles attached to it. So in this example, we have four striker roles. These are the, the most well-known striker roles, like the box striker, the target man, false nine, and link up. But, but one thing that we also did, which is not shown here, we have also, together with the coach and the sporting director, the, the chief scouts, we have all, um, together, we have created a document in which, in which it says, okay, what do we want a left back at Casapilla to do? Which are the characteristics based on what, what, the, what, so what, what the coach wants and what the scouts are looking for? And then we try to translate these roles into data. And for example, for a left back, we would then have in this table here, we would also have number five Casapilla left back role, which is a specific role targeted for what we want the left back to do at this club in attack and in defense. And one last thing about this slide is with, with these, with the style and ability metrics, we can also uh, measure two different things. For example, Chris Wood, his best role is a box striker because he has a fit score of 75, which means that his percentile scores on the style metrics that are for the that we defined for the box striker, he scores better than 75% of the other strikers and his ability score. So based on the, let me go back. So his ability score on how good is he at doing the things that we want um, a box striker to do, he is a 56, so a little bit better than, than average. And so how does, how do the new profiles look compared to the old ones? One thing that is different immediately is the uh, is the we don't have we don't have everything on one, on the same uh, uh, in uh, on the same overview. We have split it into two different columns. One column is the role fit, so how does the style of play fit? And the left column is about how uh, good is the player at doing things. So, so for example, Chris Wood he has a high cross reception volume, so he fits well. Blue is in this case blue is better than average and red is below average. So he has a high cross reception volume, high shot volume, not as high box touch rate, not as high as we would want for a uh, box striker. And his we he, here we selected the non-defending striker role. And what we did here, uh, we said we set the target for high press involvement and tracking back, we set the target to zero. And since his raw value is Six, he fits really well into this non-defending style of play. And then on the left side, we can see, okay, so if he fits well into the box striker role and how good does he do it? The thing that we are asking to, so he, he runs in behind a lot. He has high uh, foot expected goals per shot. So he's getting on the end of good chances. And then he, we have his reception value. So receiving into tight and dangerous spaces is not 
as good as that compared to other strikers. So this, the left side allows us to um, evaluate its ability into the selected role. And last slide is what can we use these roles for? We can use these roles for uh, identifying players that could be interesting for our scouts to start watching. And by using these roles, you want to, uh, uh, to um, not make the mistake that Gary mentioned about finding the right player for the wrong system. I don't know how he said it, but uh, finding a very good player for the, for the wrong team. You can find a player, for example, here we, let's say, let, let's say we, we really like the fact that Chris Wood is strong in the air and he is getting on the end of chances here. But what if you're looking for a false nine pressing striker? How does Chris Wood, let, let's say we decide to bring him in and what does the data tell us about it? The, the data tells us that his attacking territory size is rather small. Instead, while for a false nine, we want a guy who drops deep and um, tries to find space to combine with teammates. So yes, we have a, a large attacking territory size, but Chris Wood doesn't have that. He, he does not have a, uh, a uh, high amount of final, uh, final third, uh, third touch rate. So that, that, that fits well within what we want a uh, false nine kind of striker to do, et cetera, et cetera. So based, if you look at this profile without going into the details even, you can see, okay, he has a lot of red, so questionable areas for a false nine pressing striker. So what let, let us do, let us, go into the data and find the best false nine pressing striker who fits the role much better. And then you can see that Roberto Firmino has a lot of blue and he would be a much better fit for a false nine pressing striker. So this is the kind of work that we do, not only for strikers, obviously, but for central defenders, fullbacks, and to be field. So we have the roles that fit exactly in what the coach of our team wants to do and what uh, the philosophy of the club is and then we go and find uh, the scouts the right players to watch from the leagues that they don't know yet very well because the leagues that they know yet that they know very well they we don't necessarily need to tell them uh, this is a false nine striker because they know it already but it can help into uh, also going back to what getting said into uh, combining this subjective with the objective so that's it for as far as my presentation goes. Brilliant, yeah, thanks a lot for sharing that, Rahu, that, oh, Enrico, that's, um, yeah, that's great. I think it gives us, uh, yeah, it's put a lot of meat on the bone for us to chew into, I think, over the over the next hour, with sort of with that, that model in itself um, and how it comes about. And I think, I think we'll start with the very, with the very basics there, I think you pretty much there, with, you know, I was going to say, you know, the various clubs both of you've worked at is how are these various attributes and traits communicated to you? The manager will have an idea of player he wants or the club overall will decide, right, we're going to have a philosophy and we'll provide the players for the manager and they have to fit these sort of parameters. Um, so it seems that the clubs you're working with, Enrico, that those profiles, position profiles are very clear. It allows you to build over several years a clear database on and evaluations of different different players. Um, but I'll, maybe I'll sort of start with Geffen. Uh, maybe his experiences, you know, has that always been the case at clubs that you've you've worked at, or are these traits being communicated on a on a very ad hoc basis? And you know, what are the pros and, and possibly obvious cons of of that yeah um i was very lucky at swansea city when i when i worked there the sort of philosophy was what we were nicknamed swans alona under roberto martinez and that that went through so whenever we had a new manager effectively our style of play didn't change the personnel were tweaked slightly um, give an example, um, we used to use wide wingers where Michael Loudrop took over, he had inverted wingers, but primarily the skill set were the same, you know, good one-on-one -on -one duels, um, link up, play well, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I was very lucky with Swansea City that 
um, when I started in the recruitment and started, I was the first sort of recruitment analyst there because traditionally we just used um, scouting, um, that I had a very, very good knowledge, obviously from my time there, of what they were looking for per position. Um, what we would do then would layer that to the needs, so possibly a supplementary need. So if you've got a left back who is fitting, ticking all the boxes, possibly they'd actually say, look, can you just think outside the box because it's going to be sort of the the backup left back or just potentially give you something slightly different. Um, so in terms of Swansea City, it was it was it was easy is probably the wrong word, but it was we had a traditional philosophy which was quite easy to follow. Um, Birmingham was pretty much the same actually, to be honest with you. When I first went there, um, obviously Gary Monk was with me at Swansea City or was with him at Swansea City, I should say. So I knew knew the way they played. And because they played such a structured game, the traditional 4-4-2, um, everyone was combative, everyone was up and down. It it was quite easy to it was quite easy to work um within that system. Again, <laughs> things conspire. Um, like a little bit like you said, is that when I first went there, we did all the statistical modeling. We sat down with the scouts. We've got we got all our players in place, and then we went in into a transfer embargo. So that's where the the, the going further afield, looking at uh, trying to tap into uh, players that haven't been scouted, really comes to its fore. Um, because yeah, we were limited w- with what we could do, and we really had to search. And through that, we we, we signed a player, um, Karim Bratty, um, who fitted the bill. He was a bit of a utility player for us. He played in multiple positions. Um, again, looking outside of the actual metrics, you have to look into his experience, his um, you know his fitness records, because um, he played multiple positions. So that's where I think it really come to the fore when you have you have you have these clear views of what's going to happen and then someone chucks a hand grenade in in this term it was a it was a transfer embargo and you have to really be flexible in what you do um but yeah i from a recruitment analyst point of view it was it was it was fun in a weird way because it gives you the chance to sort of show what you're all about and show how this this, this type of thing works okay brilliant brilliant um enrico you obviously you knew came in it seems that I just wondered to what extent were these profiles already in place um, in, in terms of position and, and how much or how much have you had to, with your part of your team, create them? Um, it, it, it's different for uh, for uh, the two clubs that I work for. At Casapilla, uh, I came in when the, uh, the, the the ownership group they bought the club in July 2020, and I came in in January 2021. So they already they had already started. But what was the, the benefit there when the ownership bought the club? There was nothing. There was one kit manager and five players, and that's it. So they had the opportunity to set up everything from from scratch, and that's that's. That's why they it is so organized and structured there right now because they, they started with the positional profiles and then go on to find the players because they had to buy a lot of players and then find the right coach for the for the for the philosophy and go from there. But at Spezia is a different thing because when they bought the club, they bought an already existing organization with players, with staff, with the uh, uh, sporting director. So there. We are still very much in the process of defining all these positional profile. What's the philosophy? What's what was what does the coach? Well, we know by now what the coach wants the players to do, but it's not yet um, uh, it's not yet so uh, clearly set up as it is at Casapia. So I I, I uh, going back to your question: Is it normal that it is so structured? I don't think so. I don't think Casapia is actually an exception, but that's because of the circumstances that have led to it being uh, like this. But I think usually it is every time. I think every time that uh, you as a club, uh, I mean, if 
you do things by the book, you buy, uh, you, uh, and you have to bring in a new coach, you bring in a coach that fits the philosophy and that you can continue with what you started. But there's also things like financial implication that does not allow you to bring in that right coach that you want. So you have to bring in a coach that doesn't fit perfectly into your philosophy. And then the question is, if this coach wants something different from his from his midfielders, then you have to uh, review these positional profiles and also review the the data profiles. I'll be maybe temporarily or maybe for long term. It depends on uh, what uh, the ownership and the clubs want to do going forward. Do we want to change our philosophy or do we do it only? Do we want to change it? for good or only temporarily knowing that this coach maybe is not something someone who we want to work with for several years so yeah it, it is uh, it always uh, it's not always as uh, clear and uh, structured as you would hope it to be but uh, yeah that, uh, that's how uh, things work i think hmm. i think yeah that's... i think um yeah for the basis then of the conversation moving forward maybe we take the the Casapia model as a as our point because it has this like you say it's a blank canvas so we don't have to get too stuck in maybe the organizational conflicts that if you're going into a club and people already have their ideas and yeah that's a conversation for another day if we just want to focus purely on right we want to start defining roles how do we go about defining those roles and once those roles are defining how do we start attaching relevant metrics to those so maybe it's easier than if we well i suppose we had the striking we'll stick with the 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 the, the sort of forward play that we had um with with chris woods i mean and for you get and having having seen that i mean if you're looking at you know how you're defining roles and I mean, what was your thoughts when you were when you you saw that? Were the things that you could see that right? That, I like how that works. There's maybe there's something you would maybe think could be added, or something no, that maybe I, overlaps too much, or no, I, 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 I definitely liked it simply because that's one of the things where don't get me wrong, I really like data, but sometimes it can fall down because it's we're measuring things that have happened not necessarily traits that the player can exhibit so for uh, I, i'll just give you an example when leon Britton, who played you know hundreds of games for the swans he started off as a, a a winger um and all his data was you know the amount of dribbles and crosses etc cetera, etc cetera. on the training ground roberto martinez who was obviously with belgium now was seen something in him and gone right this player is going to play my defensive midfield so that's the type of thing where you've got to think outside the box um, and not just use what has happened, but try to have some insight. And again, going back to sort of my first point about the, the expert eye, you know, I'm I'm not someone who says it's got to be data, 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 data. I think it's very strong and it definitely has its place, but you've got to have some sort of expert opinion in there as well. Um Another uh, another example with Swansea City, where I was actually trying to sell um, the premise of a, a data driven approach. We had a meeting with the chairman. Um, I got told to, to create the report, uh, do a presentation. We sat down, and the chairman looked at me and said, "Well, that's fine, but we don't always look for players that are doing well, which is a really good point." And I thought, oh, "Okay." And he said, "Like Scott Sinclair was absolutely amazing for us. Scored a hat trick, got us to the got us to the Premier League. We bought him because no one else wanted him at the time. That sweeping statement, no one else wanted him, but he wasn't top of everyone's shopping list at the time because if you look at his data, he wasn't hitting his potential. And that's something that you know I've always kept in mind. Can we look at something extra? And I think from what Enrico was showing there, it showed not just what they are doing, but." Could they possibly fit into another position? Are they more suited for another position? Yeah. And yeah, I think that's a very strong point of what they're doing, and I like it a lot. Yeah, and adding to that, we something similar and not exactly the same, but one thing that we also do in uh, when we are making short lists for players, we have also we have different scenarios like show me the players that are doing well based on data, but also show me players who did not do well last season, but they did 
do well two or three years ago. So they might there might still be something there. And the fact that they did not do well last season, or maybe they did not play often last season, might mean that they are uh, maybe maybe the Cubs are not looking at them. So maybe it's for us an opportunity to bring in a player who can then go on to be good again. 100% agree with that. And that's what I was sort of alluding to when I said um, in my presentation, what time scale do you look at? Look, if we just look at the last 10, 15, 20, even 30 games, effectively we're looking at form. Well, if I've got a player, who, as you said, is coming back from injury or um, a player who's only just burst onto the scene and hasn't got a consistent performance pattern at the moment, those type of players are excluded from that. So, yeah, no, 100% agree. 100% agree. Yeah. I think you just dropped on a on a key phrase there, Geffen, and you're kind of you're looking at at patterns. I guess if we're looking at players' attributes, you know, as you say there, with you know, we're not just looking at so someone is performing in a role. We're kind of looking at you know, what is the total package of this player. He may have a little bit more than what he's being able to show working within a certain system. system. Yeah, definitely. How how you know, how do you then pick up on those like say if we're moving away from the traditional metrics which which you know Enrico showed perfectly with his with his presentation that right this show what the outcomes are I guess you know if we're looking at certain intent certain things that their players able to do how how can that be highlighted you know within what the current tools are um from my personal I talk about my personal experience as I said when I was at Swansea City, we 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 used the the um, sort of the third party data as our starting point. So your Opters or your Y Scouts, Huddle, whatever you want to call it, as our starting point, and did, did these large data grabs. Once we'd identified a player, we'd have a key set of metrics specific that the manager and the coaching staff wanted from again left back, centre midfield, Falstein, whatever it may be, and we would clip up those attributes. Um, over a number of games, once you get a buy-in for that player, then we continue it to have a, a, a larger, a larger analysis, as it were. Um, so, for example, one of the one of the first arguments I had in terms of in terms of data with one of the coaches is that they said I asked, right, okay, what are the important attributes of a centre midfielder, your attacking midfield, whatever it may be. And he said, they should all be the same. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we want to play this total football model that defenders can attack and attackers can affect. I said, that's fantastic. That's, in the utopian world, that's fantastic. So give me, from my data set, I'll tell you um, the best player. Give me the position. And I think he said something like left back. I said, brilliant, Ronaldo. And he looked at me stupid and swore and said, yeah, but in your world, if everything is equal, then you're always going to be picking those players doesn't matter what position so yes you want your defenders to be comfortable on the ball and be able to play forward but there are certain traits which are unique to a position like you mentioned your um the cat and dog analogy which i thought was great you pair them up so you don't necessarily want center half to be exactly the same you probably want one to be more aggressive you probably mm -hmm. want one to be more the the ball the ball player so yeah, we we would have sort of then a set of specific traits outside of the the data grab that I would go in and look at individual games and can we using coding so using sort of your sports code where I actually watch the game, clip it up, and then create profiles that way, and that's where again re reverting back to my presentation, I would hand pick the games originally. So if you're looking at a centre forward, what do they do in a nil nil draw? Because you know they haven't scored, so what's their all-round game like? Are they still running the channels? Is their hold-up play still good? And it's quite hard to to gauge the the psychological side or the personality, but it gives you a feeling for a player if they are still running the channels when they two nil down, if they are still trying to press from the front. Um, not you know, it's not an exact science, but it gives you a feel for the player. Yeah, Rico, on that, I mean, clearly within your model, all of the players for the different sort of attributes that you were looking at, and I'm sure there's, you know, maybe interesting to see some of the metrics that you're looking at that enable you to come up with, at the end, you're putting an, uh, uh, an evaluation on that player's 
ability in terms of his skill level in a certain uh, attribute and also you know how he's performing that within the role he's being asked and just wondered how how that number is derived um so the number is basically a percentile which basically means um if, if we are evaluating a, a player on let's say three for example three style metrics and he scores um um now, when we are evaluating a player on on three style metrics, we look okay. What's what's uh, the the sample? And let's say we are comparing him with twenty five other players in the same position. We are looking in terms of the metric number one. Where does he rank? How how good does he do is compared to others? And let's say for metric one, he is a is he is in the seventy fifth percentile. Metric two, he is also seventy fifth. And in the third metric is the 50th percentile, so it's league average. We just take the average of those three, and that ends up being the the the, the score that is shown in in the in the in in the role overview. Okay, so I need like a percentile of whatever. The, yeah, it the, is a the percentile sample per size you're using in terms of 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 players that you're looking at, rather. Well, but would that be in the could be the whole league you're looking at or players across several leagues or just a specific number and i guess that then makes that quite um quite a flexible model because you know as you you know first of all we're looking at league wide and then and, you know as your search narrows down i suppose you can run that again and like right well we've yeah. identified the five best from each of the 10 leagues and now we've got 50 and all right these are you know, yeah, make this one, one thing then, important... then we're ranking them but i guess you know when you have players if you're looking at players across different leagues then i know how you measure that because you're playing at different levels of standard and yeah, yeah that, that's, that's what i was about to say we at the moment the profile that we have they are always compared within the players within the same league when we are looking, let's say we are looking in uh, Serie A to, to buy a certain player, and we are look we are, we are always looking at uh, data from players across the whole world. But then the main question is how does a left back with very good stats in Czech Republic how does this translate to Serie A? Mm. And Usually, at the moment, it's always done by the, the, the scouts and the sport directors. You just ask them the expert opinion. How do you think this guy with great stats in a lower league can translate to our league? But something that we are working on at the moment is something similar to, I don't know if you guys know, the Smarter Scout that uh, platform. They have a league adjustment stuff. Mm -hmm. And what they do is, based on all historical transfer for left backs from Czech Republic to Italy, they look, okay, how do the stats of the player in general for this position, how do they in general change when a player makes a move from Czech Republic to Italy? And so how can we expect his performance to, uh, to change when going into a, into a more difficult, uh, going to play into a more difficult league? And this is also something that we are creating ourselves at the moment. So we call it a, yeah, league correction model or transfer model. There are different names for that. Different names for that. But what we're doing is, is a similar approach, looking at historical transfers and how do the stats change when going from one league to the other. But we are also adding to that something that I don't know if there is other people, at, at least not in the public sphere. I've never seen it there. That we are not all, all, only looking at okay, how do the stats change when a player goes from league a to league b but also how does a player going from the best team in czech republic to a relegation team like spezza in Serie A, and how do his stats change as opposed as when he is a also a uh, bottom team uh, as opposed to when he comes from a bottom team in his own league and goes to a team that also plays at the bottom of the league in a new league because that probably means that they have the same kind of same style of play, same uh, um, context as circumstances that they are 
uh, asked to, uh, to uh, operate in. So we are also looking at the relative to the league team strength when going from one league to the other, but also at playing style. So um, let's say, let's go back, let's go back two, three years in time where Barcelona and Atletico Madrid were still both top teams in the league, but with a very different style. How does a player that goes from Barcelona to Man City, how does his stats change as opposed to a player that goes from Atletico Madrid? To Manchester City. I mean, they're they're both going from top team to top team, but the teams they come from and the teams they go to, they have different styles of play. So this also affects how their stats might change, and this, those are all, all all things that we are trying to take into account in our uh, model. And then the the best thing would be to to when our model uh, predicts a change in stats that is uh, that agrees with what the experts say so yeah it's your model is predicting something and it's like yeah to me with the expert it makes sense so uh, yeah let's uh, let we we can uh, trust this model to judge players that we don't know nothing about and at least to at least have a first impression of, on how this player might adapt to our league to our team uh, when you're doing all of this, Enrique, I think you, you, you kind of mentioned smart scout, but I just wondered uh, to what extent are you using um, like third party data and those data providers and how much are you is like bespoke, you know, you've created your own sort of data collection models. Uh, all, all the things that I showed earlier in the presentation and that was, I spoke about, we all do this ourselves. So we have a contract with one of the, the data providers and based on the raw event data, we create all, all our analysis. So the player profiles, but also the opposition analysis. And what we use third party data for is two things to validate if our, the things that we create ourselves are more or less in line with what they have. So Basically, did we make uh, any uh, latent mistakes? Yes or no? Usually not, fortunately. And another thing that we use third-party data for, but also what is being posted around in, uh, in the public sphere is basically to get um, ideas from. So me and my colleague, we are always on Twitter and on LinkedIn looking at what other people are doing. And as, as soon as we see something, oh, this is very interesting, Let's incorporate this also in our uh, daily, uh, in, our, in our in our database, in our data analytics platform. And sometimes we see something that uh, looks interesting, but we have this ourselves, and we still think that our approach is better or more targeted to what we are doing here. And then we decide not to not to use it, but we are always looking at what others are doing and try to learn from them. But in the end, we. Uh, like to create everything ourselves because if you create everything from scratch yourself it's also easy to uh, make small changes based on uh, maybe the new sporting director wants something else the new code wants something else and third party data is always yeah, it, it is things are calculated in a certain way like the data provider has thought to be best and usually it's very hard if you ask them okay can you maybe calculate this differently because for us it's better and then usually the answer is no, which I understand from their point of view. But last but not least, I, me and my colleague for sure also by speaking about myself, I really like calculating everything myself from scratch because it's also, I mean, that's why we are data scientists for, we like to do this. Uh, it's used, it's used almost like, maybe it's not the right way to put it, but it's used lazy, just using something that someone else has calculated the while you can do it yourself. And maybe you can do it yourself uh, slightly better or, I don't know, differently, like you, like you want to do it. It, gives, it just gives you more, more control about, what, uh, about the thing that you are uh, creating. I think, yeah, well, before I think, well, I'll, I might go back into that world of third party um, with Gethin and because um, I still think there's a, a a whole world of football out there, just purely because of their finances. Who, that's what you know. They're first dipping into the toe of using data to support their recruitment. That's what they'll be used. So, with your ex early experience.
experiences there with with Swansea and that third party. It seems that you third using the third party data, you were still able to, you know, how do you go about maximizing that, absolutely getting the most possible out of it and still trying to find that sort of little nugget of competitive advantage with something that, you know, everyone has access to. And before yeah. then we will move on to this bespoke world where it's a lot easier to get that competitive advantage because you're just going in your own direction. Yeah, well, I think the first port of call when I was at Swansea and at Birmingham was just realising that there are so many third-party providers out there. And like Enrico mentioned, they all do stuff slightly differently. So the, the first point of call is to do your homework. Um, obviously, things out of your control, like budget, come into play, where possibly not the one that you would choose, the third-party provider that you would choose, happens to be the cheapest and that's the one that the chairman possibly is prepared to fund you have to weigh up then you know the the risk and rewards is having this data which you're not 100 percent comfortable with um does it give you enough information that you can have informative decisions or you can work with a little bit like enrico mentioned the, the beauty of data is doing it yourself, you know, having the data, creating your data. I think at the top, obviously I've never worked for Man United, Man City, you know, the big clubs have never worked for any of them, but at the top, I'm guessing they have the the the, the team, the, the team numbers in the background to do all that. Working with smaller teams, smaller recruitment teams, smaller analyst teams, you have to fight um, a little bit clever, off the box a little bit clever. So, yeah, the first point of call was to do for me was to do the research and to see what metrics you use and which providers give you the most reflective of how you would do it. So the, an example of which the one that's quite in vogue at the moment is obviously the expected goals. And if you look into expected goals, expected assists, there's such a variation with how people calculate it. So some people just have very simple models. Some people have quotes such as um, uh, the, the degree risk of the shot as rated by the analyst. So that's very subjective, which sort of throws is it even worth using the data? Others use X, Y, Z. So they just have not only the position of the pitch, but the height of the ball, which obviously changes. So looking into stuff, just taking two or three uh, bits of information from three different providers, you can see that they've calculated it massively different. Um, so actually doing your research and finding out how they've calculated it and does it best suit what you're trying to achieve before before you uh, obviously put the money down. Let me then swing it back then to Enrico, where all right, we uh, we have that blank canvas. We're, we're creating our own sort of data metrics, and I guess here we we can decide what rabbit hole we want to go down now. <laughs> I guess in a in a little way, uh, Enrico. But when. And the thing is, Gethin says that you know, we're, we're always we're trying to bring data in it to provide objectivity, but there is a danger that you know there's still going to be a level of subjectivity there, depending on how you start to de define those metrics that you use. So, I guess yeah, how how does that process go about then when you have that blank canvas and we're you know we're we're starting to create our own values? How do those discussions go about how does it i guess ultimately once you have a defined definition that all right it's going to be can be a little bit subjective but it's your own subjectivity and ultimately everyone is being judged on the same thing so it does give you a an idea a level of objectivity or at least one that you can trust in yeah that's a it's a, a good question but but one thing that we did uh, when we uh, set well, when we created our own uh, metrics is th there is a way that uh, I think metrics A should be calculated. My colleagues think differently. Maybe the, 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 the scout thinks differently. So what, what we did for every metric that we, we tried uh, three, four, five uh, uh, ways of calculating certain metrics. And then we, what we did, we went, we did from a data 
perspective, we did a validation like, okay, what if we calculate progressive passes in this way? And then we look at all players uh, who, for who we have calculated this metric and how, and all players that, and how does this metric translate over season? So if someone has, uh, um, um, so if someone has a high or low amount or score on progressive passes, does he also go on to have it in the next season? Basically, does is this metric stable? Does this translate over seasons or does it not give us uh, information? So if, if, if the metric, if, if the metrics are not more or less the same over seasons, over a large group of players, then is it even measuring something if it's not uh, measuring the same every season? So we did a validation on every metric, basically trying to say, okay, has this, does this metric have some predictive ability? So if a metric has, is a, if a metric has predictive ability and is stable over several seasons, then it's probably the, the right one, the right way. The, no, let me go back. If you have five different ways of calculating one metric, you pick the one which has, which has the best predictive uh, value over several seasons. Basically, that's how we end up uh, defining which metric, how to calculate one metric. And sometimes, sometimes a certain person was right because was right because his way of calculating it was the best. And sometimes I'm right. So yeah, it's in the end, it's always about choosing what, uh, from an objective point of view, is the best way to calculate it. And I think that was throw then this this one open open. I like would trying to look. You say with this conversation that we're now looking at trying to un understand player attributes beyond what he's just doing in a role. So there's going to be certain things where, you know, I suppose to a certain extent, we're kind of looking at player intentions and, and behaviors in a pitch. And I just wondered how then within the model, do you, can you very easily pull out, you can build in an algorithm that would pull out this sort of information that's probably not naturally available. And so I don't know whether it's level of context that you're looking at different times in a game when a player is is doing a things to see if he's still doing further things that are natural to him in the first minute of a game is he still doing it in the final minutes of a game where you know maybe he's tired is going to be impacted by the score at that time of the game or would it be something as simply that we just build a grid on the pitch to understand right if he's in if he's in the sort of right back position which is grid one what passes is he playing from that position and what is his completion rate? I don't know what kind of layers that you're putting on to understand what a player's attributes would be around the pitch. Or if there's any, if you're working towards that or if there's any open ideas that either of you have that think, uh, we've, I've thought about this to see whether this yeah. may be a way of, a different way of looking at things. Well, the first, the the first thing that springs to my mind and what I've done um, and what I continue to do is when I'm looking looking at looking at a position, obviously the first thing to do is find out what is their role within that team and what they expected to do for the consistency. So a prime example, you could have a three-man central midfield, but one of them is the attacking midfielder, one of them is the box the box, and one of them is the DM. They're going to be doing different things. Um, I think... For the, the the second point of call was within your sort of question, you wouldn't use one metric. And from the past, I tried to combine a number of metrics to get an output. Um, so an example would be you would take the quantity of how many times they've tried to do something with a success measure, with uh, an outcome measure, and then possibly, depending on the position, um, like, 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 like you alluded to, the area of the field that they were doing it in. So, mm -hmm. someone like an attacking midfielder, you're expecting them to give the ball away. You're expecting to James, James Madison to give the ball away now and again because he is so creative that he's trying to, you know, thread, thread a ball through a, a mouse hole, as, as it were. So, you give in that he's going to have a lower um, pass completion rate in the final third going into the box than say, I don't know, a city midfielder, a Casemiro is keeping things ticking over. So you just build that within your calculation. And 
the beauty would be is that because you're comparing oranges and oranges, you're going to compare Madison to other attacking midfielders. You're expecting them to have the same sort of success rate, same sort of touches in the final third, um, as opposed to, again, comparing him to Casemiro, who's going to have the ball a hell of a lot more, and he's going to keep it a lot more because it's a much safer pass. Enrico, it's over to you as the stats man. <laughs> no, I think, uh, yeah, I nothing to add there. It's, it makes perfect sense, and I think that that um, to uh, what one thing, for example, the, the example that you mentioned about medicine, he is going to lose the, the ball often. So, in, in our case, when we make a offensive midfielder um, uh, profile, data profile, we Will not we will choose not to add any any uh, metrics related to uh, ball retention because you know that uh, you, you don't want him to necessarily be good at that because it's part of his game. So if we have an, uh, a creator attacking midfielder role, we won't have we won't evaluate him on uh, on uh, on ball retention ability or pass success rate most likely. Or maybe you you maybe we would do it knowing that okay. Everyone is bad at it, but he is le he is less bad than all the others. But I think in the end we won't even we we will focus much more on how, how many uh, chances does he create, what is his pass value, what is his ability to beat opponents one on one, and go on to create uh, danger in the opposing penalty area. So yeah, it's again making sure that uh, you are looking at the relevant metrics of a player and comparing oranges to oranges. Yeah. Yeah. Just going back to data, because I sort of linked it into the previous conversation. There's some out there, and you'll see a stat for, say, 50-50 challenges. Well, by definition, if it truly is a 50-50 challenge, you're not going to have 80-90% success rate, because if it is, then someone's either calculating wrong or the definition is totally wrong. So, yeah, mm -hmm. using the correct information, the correct metrics to get at what what you're actually looking for and being wary of, of how they calculated but yeah hats off yeah. to you you know doing it doing it the way you guys are you're doing it from the ground floor up you're making the metric what you want from it specific to what's required for your team so that is the way to go in my eyes yeah yeah i mean it needless to say that's also that uh, the we thing is the way to go. Otherwise, we would not have. Uh, we won't be it doing so. it. <laughs> 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 but again, again uh, your comment about having a blank canvas that helps a lot. And privilege is probably the wrong word, but it's it's, it's a handy situation to be in because you're given that sort of flexibility, that freedom to sort of make mistakes in the beginning, but create something and make it grow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but coming coming back to. Uh... To uh, what we were discussing before about third-party data, I mean, yes, we are in a very um, uh, fortunate position to be able to work with the raw event data and create everything from scratch. But I think it's it's perfectly possible to to uh, create a proper analytics um, setup within a club only using third-party data if that's what. What the budget allows. So I think 100%, I think 100%. we should not we should not uh, I don't know um, I don't want to 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 create the idea that if there is someone from a smaller club listening and saying yeah we will never be able to do that to do things the the right way or the proper way I think it's perfectly possible to run an analytics department with third party data and one example is just look at what is there uh, around in the public sphere in analytics sphere on Twitter. There are mm -hmm. people doing amazing, amazing jobs with free data. So if they can do it, then any club, even with the smallest budget, can do it. So it's def definitely, I think, having the ability to work with the raw event data from the great data providers is, is not a prerequisite to be successful in analytics, not at all, but it just adds maybe a few percentages on top of what others are doing. Uh, I have a couple of simple questions before I give you a, a little hypothetical scenario to see uh, test how these little models work. But I think one little area came to circling around it, and it's just 
you know, we there's now with the video of games spanning, you know, you can look at a player's whole career. So again, when you certainly from from the beginning and Gethin's presentation was there, like you know how how much of that career is going to be relevant to a report that you will be making, so that you can make a decision on whether that player is right for you now. Um, I just wondered in general when you're evaluating a player, just exactly how many games are you looking at? Are you just looking picking up data from the season, the current season, or you're certainly going back 12 to 18 months, or does it depend on, again, the life cycle of that player, how old he is? Yeah, I I, I think it's from pers- personally, it was like an individual, um, on an individual basis. For example, um, I think we mentioned earlier, if it's from a league that we know nothing about, like I went out to Denmark quite a few times, didn't know anything about the league. So my first point of call was just do this whole uh, data grab. And when I did when I did that, I was looking at pretty much the last 12 months um, just to get a feel of what's going on. If you know the player, for example, if, if, if they're based in the UK, they're based in England, you, you, you probably don't always need to do 12 months. You're looking at um, I don't know, their form within the season or the last 10, 12 games. But again, you're trying to work it that you get a full full viewpoint of the player. So possibly filtering the data so he's only, you're only looking at games he's played in the specific position that you, you're looking to recruit for. Uh, and likewise for, for you, Enrico. Yeah, I don't think I don't have something like general rules about okay, should we be looking always in the last season or the last two seasons? It it basically depends on uh, the player that we are uh, looking at. For example, if we're looking at a data profile of a goalkeeper, always go back two or three seasons because shot stopping statistics they are very uh, they change over seasons. So for goalkeepers, always look. Uh, as far back as possible, as, especially when looking at um, save percentage and expected goals versus goals conceded, stuff like that. And then for other positions, it depends. I mean, if, if we if we have a uh, uh, if you're looking at the data profile of a player that has played more than uh, 1500 minutes in the last season or in the current season, then I'm. I'm saying to myself, okay, this is a quite uh, good sample for his performances at this moment. I will still go back and look at data from one or two seasons ago, but that would be more as a confirmation of what I'm seeing in the previous season, or maybe to uh, to uh, to say, okay, is this one very good season, and was he not as good before? So has he has he been improving, or is this season a one-off? So it, it, it depends if I'm looking, I always choose to look at the most recent data, if the sample is big enough and otherwise go back to uh, older seasons. That's basically it. Or maybe one, one example also, if we are looking at the player, we have, especially with a player Bastoni who can play both central midfielder and a left back. Sometimes we want to evaluate him. Uh, we want to know how good is he doing at left back. But if he played only central midfielder last season, then we we, we would not focus too much on last season stats. But then go two or three seasons ago where he played as a left back more often. And the same for players that we are recruiting. We are recruiting a left back. We know it that he can play there, but he has been playing as left winger or maybe a right winger. I'm thinking of uh, Saka from Arsenal here. So, uh, yeah, you also have to, to check, okay, in, on which position did he play in a certain season and what is the most relevant uh, set of data for us to uh, look at? I just ask with the, the clubs you're working with, um, the, the, I don't know whether I feel whether you then send there's like live scouting reports going on that a, a scout will go and watch a live game once you've narrowed down you know, the sort of players that you want to look to. Is there a scout then goes to the live games? And I just wondered to what extent that report 
the aspects of a player that they're reporting on, how much that mirrors the, the data models? Um, but fortunately, often uh, it, uh, the, the, what the scout sees and what the data says, they are in line. Sometimes it, it's not. And then for us, it, the most interesting to do is why is it not aligning? Is it maybe because the way we are calculating the, the stats is not the same as the scouts are judging them? Or maybe it, it's always possible that uh, the scout has watched one or two very good or very bad games to start with of a certain player. Well, the data gives an overview of the all of the last season. So the most important thing is trying to understand why there are differences. And I think most of the time, uh, when you understand from each other uh, where the difference can come from, you end up agreeing, okay, yes, the data does not say this is, uh, data says that this aspect of the play is not as great as the scout things, but we know it's because we are calculating it differently or we have no way of calculating this with the current data at hand. And yeah, vice versa, if a scout is not seeing something that the data is seeing, he might go on to watch two, three, four, more, five games on Y scout, and maybe uh, in the end it will be more close to what the data says, or maybe not, and then it's another discussion to have. So, but I think most often that fortunately the the if things are done right, the data and the scout opinion usually align. Okay, I mean. I guess um, I, in an ideal world, uh, it makes it easier to make decisions anyway, uh, getting if what the, the scout is seeing aligns with what your data is telling you. But it's really sort of how do you go about ensuring that the, the, the live scouts are evaluating players along similar lines as, as what you're looking at as a, as a data analyst? Um. <laughs> Working as working as a team is the main thing. Obviously, setting out your um, your definitions, your just just the way of operation um, pre season. Um, obviously, that that's that's a trickle down effect. It has to come from the top. So, whether or not it's the it's the manager possibly, or the head of recruitment, or whoever the the key stakeholder is. Um, you do you you do get uh, differences of opinion. You definitely do. Um, I think Enrico's point about you know if the play if you go and watch a player and the scout goes to watch the player sorry and they see or perceive a player totally different maybe that they've watched a one-off game that's happened to me many times um, off my own data um, I can think of one example where a player in the championship who's still playing now comes up very very highly and every time I've gone to watch him live he's been very poor. You just have to just just have to realize that if you go to a game, it's not necessarily gonna be the perfect match for you. Okay, so the Geffen is frozen there. Um, let me Geffen come back on that one. Um, and finally, I was this little hypothetical question where I think it sort of came up that you know we're kind of evaluating players very much within positions and roles, but sometimes you know if we're judging their attributes, we may be able to see whether they you know they may have a have a skill and aptitude to for your team to play in a slightly maybe more advanced role or a more defensive role depending on those attributes that they're showing um i think a big conversation in football in the last 12 months around trent alexander arnold is right back who everyone believes can be a very creative midfield player um with your data model you know, he's playing right back for Liverpool every week. How are you able to evaluate whether he could be a midfield player for your for your club? How 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 do you go about judging his attributes and understanding if he could still perform at a similar level on the ball, maybe in a more advanced or more internally inside position? Yeah, I think it's very, very hard to do so because one of what the key things on uh, when evaluating players with data is you are evaluating players based on the minutes that they played on a certain position. So if 
Alexander Arnold has never played as a center midfielder. You don't have data from his performances at that position. So it's hard to, uh, to, to judge. But one thing that we have been thinking about, which we have not uh, been testing yet, but you can do something, you can do something similar to the transfer model. You can look at historical players who transferred from right back to central midfielder, like Lam, like uh, the, by other, the current Bayern München uh, right back, whose name I'm now forgetting, Kimi. They all were, were right back <laughs> in the past. They are now central midfielders. So there, there are several cases, well, not many, maybe not maybe several cases like that, but more cases like a left back going to play a winger, winger going to play left back. So you can look at all historical uh, position transfers and see what attributes did the player as a left winger, all the players that went from left winger to left back and have made the transition successfully, what st stats when playing as a winger was he doing well at and trying to define stats that can be uh, can be uh, success factors for a transition to a, to a uh, wing back role. So that, that's something that we have briefly been thinking and discussing, but uh, we haven't uh, tried to implement yet. But that could be the way to, to do it. So uh, I don't know. Yeah. So for Trent Alexander Arnold, see what stats, how his stats look like compared. The, those to Lam and Kimmich and the things that made Lam and Kimmich click in midfield, which is, I think, not, it's actually quite hard. I mean, if you say, okay, Lam and Kimmich were good at this, Trent's also good at this, so he could make a good midfielder, but it also depends on so many other things, the, 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 the team as a whole, the, the teammates in midfield, what are they doing, what are they asked to do? So you, you only, uh, next to only comparing what a specific player was doing when moving a position, you also have to have a similar context in which the player moved from one position to the other. So I think it's very hard. I mean, technically, theoretically, hypothetically, it's possible, but if, it's, if it is going to give us the right results or enough uh, results, I don't know, but it's definitely interesting to, uh, to, uh, to test, try. Yeah, yeah. Whether there's something there to be, again, seems then that the, as a model, it's still based on this notion of position. So everything is tied to right backs, historically, then measuring him to other right backs. Is there a way, maybe, is it to look at players that we don't, we kind of remove the idea of position from them and just look at what are they doing in different parts of the pitch? So we look at every player as being like a universal player and how well does he perform in different parts of the pitch and under different levels of pressure. And then if we're looking at like that, to what extent through the video analysis, are you able to, okay, we can actually judge a player like this because the technology allows us to do that. Yeah, I, I think this is actually a, a good point that you made there about uh, about uh, uh, forget about positions and look at what a player is doing on the pitch because that's something that I actually tried two years ago, but I had actually forgotten that I did. So so it's good to be remembered of that because at some point I was just looking at I, I was uh, comparing players purely based on what they are doing on the pitch. So I I have a, uh, a striker. And show me the based on data the ten most similar players. And in those ten most similar players, there were three strikers and six offensive midfielders. So I was like, okay, why is this? And then I went on to uh, look uh, what what this striker was doing, and he was playing a, a false nine role, always dropping back in midfield, combining with the midfielders. So yeah, based on this. You could say, okay, maybe this guy could play as a attacking midfielder because basically being a striker, he's already playing like an offensive midfielder. So if you would give, if the coach would give him the role offensive midfielder officially on the match uh, sheet, maybe he can, he can play uh, well there too. Yeah, I think uh, it, yeah, now, now that I'm 
thinking back at it at this uh, little uh, ex experiment at it a few a few years ago i'm thinking why did we not continue with it so i'll uh, i think this is something for next week to dive into i think so <laughs> On a, on a side note to that, sorry, guys, my connection's been bad, by the way. Um, on a side note to that, quite a few times when you're presenting, like, uh, data analysis to a coach or possibly a manager, there is always, if say, for example, you're looking for a left winger or a centre midfielder, there is always a player, data-wise, that pops up and they always say, well, he isn't a left winger, he isn't a centre midfielder, they're a... I don't know, right back, whatever it may be, which goes to show that possibly they have got the transferable skills. Um, and it goes back to the philosophy of the club. If you're a possession-based team, really, um, they're looking at players who've got high pass success rate. Can they take the ball under pressure? Can they play forward and still keep the ball? So it should, like you mentioned, Steve, um, be sort of irrelevant if they're classified as a left-back, right-back, centre-back, DM they should be transferable skills. Um, and again, going back to one of the very first things we talked about is that the expert eye, they tend to be the ones that you sort of go to then and say, look, the data suggests this. Do you think... So you're looking for some sort of validation from an ex-pro, I guess. This is what the data show. I mean, this, I, I believe it. I'd go and watch the 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 video on Y Scout, um, like Enrique mentioned, and then looking for that validation. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I guess it has to be there. I mean, there's, there's, if you're evaluating players for your team, it certainly seems there's a there's a security that if we're looking for a right back. This is a right back. This is how he performs as a right back. Yeah. But yeah. hold on, we have this winger over here who, okay, he may be... Possibly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Gareth <Yeah>. Bale. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's the obvious <laughs> obvious example. Well, from left back to, to flying winger. Um and I guess like then, if you're trying to, like you say, those transferable skills that I guess you, you then have to start thinking about them less as, as he, this is a right back and he does this okay in this position, you have to look yeah, at him. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, if you're looking at him outside of the box, you have to maybe create a way of evaluating that is a little bit outside the box as yeah. well. And, and from experience, so what, um, what a manager might often say is that they don't want specifically a centre half or a mid they want a player that can play in multiple positions. So the obvious one, if you want to play a flat back four, but then you might want to change up the three centre halves. You know, you're looking at a player that can transfer to possibly a left back, possibly the left side, possibly the the the, the, the centre man in a in a three. So then you start bringing in. Physical qualities as well. Well, I know what my manager wants. He wants them to be at least six, you know, you, you know, physically dominant, at least six foot two or whatever it may be. And you start building a profile in a different way then, which a lot of the times when we look at the data, um, the technical data, we don't fit in the physical attributes of a player, whether it would be his height and size or his, you know, the distance covered, his high intensity sprints and Going forward, I think that's one avenue that will come more and more together, merging, instead of taking things into isolation, look at the player as a package. I guess the one, the question that I've been dying to ask you, Gethin, if, uh, is, there, is there any data in the world that would have allowed you to see Liam Britton as a defensive midfield player? <laughs> Honestly... I don't know. I've probably seen every single game he ever played up until that point, where every single home game at least he, he played at that point. And I, I can hand on heart, didn't see him as a defensive midfielder in terms of data. I have no, I, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one if I'm honest. <laughs> but again, it's not an isolated incident with, uh, with, with, with our team. Mark Galwa was the same. He converted from a winger to a centre midfielder as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like you mentioned, in Giggs also went from uh, winger to midfielder. So yeah, I, I'm thinking, yeah, it's very hard to see these things with data because when the, I'm assuming when these things happen, they might be happening in training where maybe the, 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 there 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 are a few injuries in a in a uh, 
11 versus 11 uh, game, the coach says, okay, uh, we need someone at center midfield, gigs play there because there is no one else and you are experienced enough to know at least what to do there. And then yeah. they find out that he can be very good there. So, yeah. and these things don't are not, at least not yet registered in data, the trainings. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Okay, on that on that note of we're maybe looking to the future of also now bringing training data into the evaluation process, uh, I think that might be a, a good place to stop. <laughs> Muddy the water. <laughs> right, Enrico and Gethin, I'd like to thank you very much for joining us on the Sunday session today. Not a problem. Thanks thank to you. Be. Too.